Good afternoon. Um, I have to say, I was, uh, I was delighted when I was invited to speak at this conference months ago. Um, and since then, I've had a chance to understand more about not just what's happening in terms of the disease categories and the impact, but also the way in which the, the Family Heart Foundation is going around its work in this. And so I've shifted from delighted to genuinely excited. Um, I think there's a lot to be, um, obviously, to be frustrated by. Um, I spent my morning listening to what's happening with the registry and listening to uh, the, the community advocates. Um, so there's clearly, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think there's also a lot of work that is happening in new ways. And so I'm gonna, that, that, that's what I'm going to target my, my comment towards. Um, as Keith said, I'm a doctor, but not a medical doctor. Um, I teach at a business school. I have spent the last 25 years or so really trying to think about innovation, and innovation in contexts that themselves are changing or need to be changed. And so what, what I thought I would share with you is a perspective on, on how, to, how I think about innovation. And then at the end, we'll apply it to thinking about what's happening in terms of lipidemia. And really, kind of my hope is that you'll take this as a view on how to listen to the rest of the conference rather than necessarily anything I'm going to say specifically about the stories that I'm going to tell you, which are largely irrelevant to anybody, but I think are illustrative of a way of thinking. Um, I should say, oh, yes. So the, what's interesting also is I, I, I do spend a fair bit of time in healthcare, and as I work with drug companies, and particularly the top two here and thinking about their journey within the cardiometabolic space, thinking about the kinds of journeys that we've been talking about here and looking at the work that's being done has been also incredibly stimulating. But I'll, I'll, I'll back it all up and understand clearly there's a problem. The way we solve problems is through innovations. And really, let's start with that. So let me ask you, does anyone recognize the man in this picture? Have a guess? Edison, look, it's an old white guy in black and white holding a light bulb. <laughs> Who else is it going to be? Yes, very good. It is Thomas Edison. And the thing that is remarkable about this picture is that, of course, Edison is known throughout the world as you know, the man who made the light bulb. Um, and anywhere you go in the world today, if you ask a child to draw a picture having a brilliant, of someone having a brilliant idea, they will draw the same picture, which is the face, and then a light bulb on top. But the light bulb, you may know, was not invented by Edison. The light bulb was invented 60 years before Edison. I'll pause there. For the light bulb to be invented 60 years before Edison, what does that tell us? It tells us that the light bulb, this greatest innovation ever, was a failure for 60 years. And so we look at what Edison did, and the theme for this talk is that what Edison did, he didn't just make a better light bulb. That was a part of his effort. The bigger thing was that when he looked at the light bulb, what the question that he was trying to answer was not how do I make a great innovation greater. This is our theme. It's the difference between great innovations that succeed and great innovations that fail. They're all great innovations. So the light bulb for 60 years was a great innovation, but it failed because no one took seriously the question that is the only question we're gonna look at today, which is the question of what else. Looking at the light bulb, what else needs to happen for it to actually matter? And so the thing that really set Edison apart from other people doing light bulbs was that he looked at the light bulb and saw all the other stuff. He saw the need to generate electricity, to bring electricity into the house. Arguably, one of his greatest innovations was the power meter, figuring out how do you charge for electricity that allowed for utilities to exist in the way we think about it. And so this is going to be our theme is this question of what else. And this is kind of the core theme um, in this book that I'm thrilled that everyone has, The Wide Lens. And the title for the conference, The Wider Lens. Um, and the notion of a wide lens is to say we're, we've been taught, we're so used to thinking about doing a really great job. You've got a task, do a great job. It's all about execution. And in the world of business, what we would teach is if you want to succeed with an effort at creating new value, you need to do three things. You need to first have a great idea that your customers care about. 
Two, you need to have a team that can actually deliver on that promise. And then three, you need to do it better than anyone else. You need to have an advantage. And historically, that's what firms would focus on. And when they were successful, it's because they did this. But if we step back, what we realize, execution, great execution, is always necessary for success. But more and more, we find innovations, efforts at doing new things, that depend on more than just what that one focal actor is doing. And that's where we need to widen our lens, where we need to add two new concepts for thinking about the work to be done. And they're tied to the idea of this, an ecosystem, that we're no longer in it together, we need to work with others. Of course, we know all that. But the question is, how do you think about working with others productively? And so the two concepts that I want to explore with you are this idea of one, co-innovation. Someone innovates, you're going to innovate. And the first question I'm going to ask is, does anyone else need to innovate for your innovation to matter? Does anyone else need to create something new? Oh, I've got a great drug. Well, someone needs to come up with a new diagnostic so that the drug actually matters in the world. That's co-innovation. And the second principle is going to be the principle of your adoption chain which is who else needs to buy in? They don't have to invent, but who else needs to participate in order for you to deliver your value proposition to that end consumer, whether that end consumer is a doctor, is a nurse, what have you, right? Who is essentially, we're gonna ask the question of who are the critical adopters who are not on the critical path, that are off but still totally matter? Right, so you know, if we can't get medical schools to teach certain things, it doesn't really matter that that knowledge is available if it's not being shared. So the plan from here is, I wanna tell you a story that has nothing to do with healthcare, and then I'm gonna give you a concept and a little test, and then we wanna step back and think about, well, what does it mean for the kinds of journeys that we've seen here? Um, and really, it's all about how do we ask and answer this question of what else? How do we look at the system and then take responsibility for changing the system as seriously as responsibility for doing the one piece that we've already been assigned or have taken on? Does that sound okay? Yeah? Okay. So I'll start with this. Anyone know what this is? Is a picture? The world's first something. Any guesses? First e-reader. Now, how do you know that? Might it be because you looked at my book? Oh, no self-control. All right, people were supposed to guess CD player and things like that, and I was gonna say, no, no, no. This is the world's first electronic book reader. And the world's first electronic book reader is launched in 1990 by a company called Sony. Now, do you remember Sony? There was a moment in time when if you wanted to talk about any company being innovative, you had to talk about Sony. That is no longer the case. Sony is a great company, they're no longer an important company. And part of what we're gonna talk about is the transition and, 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 and why that transition took place. But this is a picture of Sony at the height of its power. Okay, it comes up with the Walkman in 1977. And it's interesting, people have been talking about electronic book readers since like, the 1920s, the 1930s, like in science fiction. Right? As soon as they realize that maybe you can store information in, in a non-analog way, Right, if you guys remember the book or the movie, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Right, that was from like the mid 70s. And it was, a, it was a digital book, it was an e-book. And people have been talking about electronic books for the same reason we talk about today, which is you can pack a thousand books into something this big. And you can add not just text, but videos and hyperlinks. So this was all in the air. And then Sony, really kind of in the mid 80s, starts this development project. So it's science fiction. Um, until the 70s, in the 70s it becomes like an academic lab project. In the 80s it gets close to something commercial. And here in 1990, Sony brings the first electronic book reader to market. And, you know, if you look at it, you know it has to fail, right? Not because it's not amazing as an idea, but the co-innovations are wrong. Okay, like, do you remember, remember what a CRT screen is? Like when TVs had depth? Right, such a power-hungry screen, so flickery, so terrible to look at. Um, if I say to you, a D-sized battery, do you know what that is? Like a D-sized battery today is like a cannonball. Really, you're gonna put three D-sized batteries in this thing, it's gonna lose power in an hour. It's a great idea, can't possibly succeed because of co-innovation. 
And what's going to happen in this story for the next 14 years or so is all kinds of companies are going to try to make their own ebook readers. Publishers are going to put them out. Electronic companies are going to put it out. Computer companies are going to come out. Are going to come out. Venture capitalists are going to invent hundreds of millions of dollars in ebook re readers, and they're all going to fail because they can never get it to be a better experience than a paper book because the screen quality is always so bad. Until, until in 2006, Sony. This is what makes them a great company, right? They didn't. The fact that they couldn't execute in 1990 doesn't mean it wasn't a great idea. So they keep at it for another 16 years. In 2006, they launched what is regarded universally as the world's first great ebook reader. Everyone who touches it, all the product reviewers, everybody loves this thing. Finally, this has happened. That's in 2006. And then in 2007, they're joined in the market by a company called Amazon and a product called the Kindle. Have you heard about that? So you know how the story's gonna end, right? The story's gonna end is that Amazon's gonna become the number one player, and Sony's gonna go from number one to number two to number four to number seven to out of the market in like three years. And our first question is gonna be, well, why, why did that happen? So, and it's interesting because actually, can you take it back one? If you look at these two products, remember this is like 2006, 2007. This is when Apple is becoming an important company and the iPod is like the main thing you want to have, right? The iPhone's about to launch. So this is when we learn that what matters is product design and the user experience and how elegant the product is going to be. And if you look at these two products, which looks to you to be the better design product? Right? It's the Sony. And by the way, it makes sense because Sony has been making beautiful hardware for 40 or 50 years. And the Kindle is the first time that Amazon has ever tried any hardware whatsoever. And if we look at these two things side by side, it becomes even more stark, right? So Sony you know, has a better design. It has a screen that is literally twice as good as the Kindle screen. Okay, it has eight, you know, so the Sony can show eight shades of gray, whereas the Kindle can only show four. Right? Those were innocent times. Eight shades of gray were regarded as quite risque. Um, that's a little literary book joke for, the, for, for those of us in. Um, eight shades of gray. Sony lets you read your book in whatever format you'd like. Whereas with Amazon, you can only read your book in a proprietary Amazon-owned format. Um, Sony lets you share your books with others. It lets you print a physical copy if you'd like to have both digital and print. With Amazon, you can't get it off of your one machine. Amazon has a nice feature, which is you can upload books wirelessly, but you know everything else in your life you're plugging into your computer, your phone, your digital camera, et cetera, so the Sony, but Amazon has that, that a nice feature. Um, and the Sony is $50 cheaper. So if you look at these two products, who should win? Right, it's you know, pretty clear it should be, Sony doesn't have to lose. Now, the only question we're going to think about, at least during my talk, was what? What was the question? Do you remember? The Edison question was? What else? All right. So obviously, we look at an electronic book reader, and we say, well, what else needs to happen for it to create its value? You have an electronic book reader. What do you need? You need electronic books, right? And what a terrible talk this would be if it ended with, yeah, and Sony didn't think of it, and that's why they died. <laughs> right, so let me ask you, is there a world where Sony could launch an electronic book reader and not know that they need electronic books? <laughs> right, like we'd like to say, oh yes, these big companies, but like, can you be so smart and then immediately after so dumb? No, okay, the answer is of course not. And so Sony, this is an amazing company with amazing people doing amazing work. So of course they realize that it's not a product versus product story, right? So it's really about solutions. And so what, what, when, we, when we move from products to solutions, what it means is we realize we need like other pieces. And so yes, of course Sony knows that they're gonna need content. And what they do is they set up their own online ebook store that you can get electronic books from. And you can actually, you can buy from any other electronic bookstore online that you'd like. Whereas with the Kindle, you can only get your books from Amazon. 
Okay, so yeah, we've moved beyond the what else. We've got this idea, now it's solutions. Okay, so now that we understand the importance of content, now who should win? And the answer is still Sony. And so here is the beginning of the shift. So what else do you need? You need books. The question of what else do you need should always give you a follow-up, which is, well, who? Who else does that mean that you need? So if you need books, who do you need to want to play with you? Publishers. The publishers. And here's what's so interesting. If you're a publisher and you are looking at all the things that make us like the Sony book, ebook reader more, well, you can read your files in any format that you want, and you can share those files with friends, and you can get your books from the Sony bookstore or any other bookstore on the internet, or really anywhere on the internet. If you're a publisher, how does that make you feel? That sounds horrific, right? I saw what happened with Napster. You want me to sign up for this? Thank you, but no. All these things are good for the customer and terrible for me. And since I have a choice, my choice is mm, no, not going to play with you. Now look at this. Take a look from the publisher's perspective, all the stuff that we didn't like about the Kindle. Oh. It's a proprietary file format. That means even if you manage to get the file off of the machine, it's just gobbledygook. Oh, and you can't get the file off of the machine. You can't back it up. You can't print it out. You can't even connect a cable to it. Like, do you think that the Amazon people knew how to build the Kindle, but they didn't know how to put in a USB port? <laughs> right? What I want you to see here is, so I mean, think about what Amazon had to do here. Okay, Amazon went out and they did customer surveys before they launched. And they said, hey folks, there are e-readers out there, what do you want ours to look like? And everybody said, well, you should make yours like Sony, but you should make it better and you should make it cheaper. And Amazon went back to the office and they're like, hmm, well, why don't we make ours worse and more expensive? Because that is exactly what the Kindle is from a consumer perspective, right? The Sony machine is a better product, but it could not bring the partners on board, right? So what I want you to see in this Kindle story is what it means to design a solution for your ecosystem, for your partners, not just for who it is that you think of as your end customer. Does that make sense? Right, so it's not that Amazon put out a terrible product. They put out a good product that allowed for a good solution. Okay, and in, in an ecosystem world, a great product will always lose to a good solution. Because unless you can deliver the solution, you have nothing. Right, so Amazon put out something. It wasn't as great a product as Sony, but they did it intentionally. They designed it in this way because what they were focusing on was bringing publishers on board. Does that make sense? Okay. And really what this is, is trying to break us away from this, uh, this mantra that people always, always like, they just like, keep repeating it in the context of innovation, which is, oh, we need to find the win-win. Win-win. We need to find a win for us, and we need to find a win for the customer. And really, win-win is a start, but if you have partners to line up, win-lose-win, is the formula for failure, right? What we need is to take responsibility for the entirety of the ecosystem that we're trying to move, and we need to get wins across the board. Does that make sense? Okay. So if that makes sense, I'm going to give you a test. We'll see how that works, and then we'll move to the application. All right, so here is my adoption chain test for you. Here are two innovations, innovation A and innovation B, and we're going to start outside of medicine just so people are more comfortable. There's an innovator, there's a distributor, there's an installer, and then there's an end customer. And innovation A is exciting because the innovator gets plus four and the distributor gets plus three. 
and the end customer gets plus five, it's a small headache for the installer. There's a minus one. And innovation B is an incremental improvement. Everyone's a little bit better off by one. Okay, this is not a, not a math test, so I will do the arithmetic for us. Okay, so the, the net on innovation A is 11, because it's plus 12 minus the one. So on average, everyone is 2.75 better off. And on innovation B, the net is plus four, and everyone gets their one. Yes? Okay, here's the test in two parts. Part one, okay, reflecting on what we just talked about, about adoption chains and Sony and Amazon. Which of these two innovations should you never bet on? Because if this is how they're going to market, they will always fail. You can say it out loud, that's the right answer. Gain some confidence. Right, so yeah, it, wh and, and why? Because they're, yeah. The logic of adoption chains is not a logic of totals, it's not a logic of averages, it's a logic of minima. A minus one anywhere breaks the chain everywhere. Because a minus one means the installer is worse off for playing your game. Okay, so good. Part one, you got correct. So out of two questions, you're now at a 50%, which is still a failing grade. <laughs> now, here's question two. In the organizations you're familiar with, which of these two innovations are the one, is the one that would get the most attention from senior leadership? And the one they would walk around and show the board and tell donors, this is why you should invest in us. Okay, that is correct. So, all right, you're at 100%, and the extra credit is, how is it possible that both of those statements are true? That the one that always gets support is the one that has to necessarily fail. Sexy. It's sexier. And part of it is, well, what do we say about that minus one? We're all aware of it. But at a minus one, what's the justification for we should still do A? It's what? It's worth it. It's, be it's better for the customer. It's better for the world. They'll have to come along. They'll, they'll come along. We kind of assume they'll come along. There's no reason for the installer to come along. Not, by the way, there are no bad guys in this picture. The installer is going to get a minus one to make the whole world better off, but the installer has, he's got kids to put through college. Okay, she's got a mortgage to pay off. Why should she make less just so you could be happier? So, at, by the way, if the installer had a minus eight, would we ever invest in A? No, because they would be screaming out, saying, no way. At a minus one, they just shrug you off to the proposal. And because of that shrug, you can keep going. But there's, you understand, if a, mi if a minus in the chain breaks the chain everywhere, it doesn't matter if it's a minus one or a minus eight, it's the same outcome. Nothing happens. This is the key of understanding adoption chains. It's looking for where the minuses are and understanding what's behind them. Anytime you've ever seen anything successful in the world, it succeeded because someone somehow got the pluses across the board. And our question is, how do you do that efficiently? Now, just to be clear, what I am not saying, I don't leave this, oh yeah, I had a speaker and he said only be incremental and only do innovation B. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is every time you see something exciting and there is so much exciting happening in this space, you want to see the minus so that you can solve the minus. Okay, how do you solve the minus? Right, so here's innovation A star. Okay, A star is everybody's dream. It's, we move a little bit of value from the distributor we give the installer a plus one. Now they're at zero. A zero doesn't make me happy, by the way. But then I take one from the end customer, and now they're at a plus one. Now there's a reason to think that they might play. Okay, can innovation A star, you know, is it guaranteed to succeed? No, there are a hundred ways you can screw it up. But it's not guaranteed to fail. But you can't make this kind of transfer until you realize that minus on the installer is the thing to solve. Okay, here's innovation A, double star. 
Innovation A double star is the realization that there's no way to make it up to the installer. It's just interfering with too many other parts of their organization and their business. They'll never come along. This is a proposal that says, well, what can we do without them? Or at least initially without them. And if you look at A double star, it's not as good as A, right? The net is plus seven. The innovator is getting a three instead of a four. A double star is not, is not as good as A, except, except A is guaranteed to fail, right? A is a fantasy. A is a, is a, a, is a bad fantasy. The word for bad fantasy is delusion. <laughs> a is a delusion. But what you need in your organization is the ability to look at a, an, a double, an, an A double star and have the person who stands up and say, look, I know our vision is plus four for us as innovators. I've got an idea. Let's do something where we get three. Three instead of four. And you need the rest of the organization to stand up and say, 25% oh, less for us? That's what we're looking for in leadership. That's very countercultural, right? And, but where it comes from, the only way it works is if there's a, a, a process to have the discussion that says, oh, that minus one is the thing we have to solve for. Right, here's a triple star. A triple star says, fine, we'll do it ourselves. But throughout here, what I want you to sense is we can look at innovations. We can look at therapeutics. Okay, we can look at treatment paths. We can look at therapies. And we have different parties participating in them. And we can make everybody better off. Right? So here, you know, if, I, if I, 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 I've got a product, it makes the end customer happy. If I make the end customer even happier, right? If I move the end customer from a plus five, I add three, I move them to a plus eight. What does that do for my problem with the installer? Nothing. Right? Adding pluses to the innovator or the distributor in this picture doesn't change my fundamental problem. Now, each one of these folks will have great ideas for why they should get more support because they could do amazing things. But someone needs to take responsibility for the system. Right? And that is the realization that it's the installer which is the problem we need to solve. Adding pluses to pluses indicates a failure to understand failure. Adding pluses to pluses is the easiest thing in the world because the people already in pluses are the ones who are most excited about talking to you and playing with you. What we need to listen to are the people who are kind of in the background hoping you don't get to them, not because they're not critical, right, but because maybe they're not excited. And then what we need to find is a solution for them. And then the question becomes, okay, but where is this coming from? Right? That is a big question. Right? And I would say when I think about you know, managing you know, lipid diseases in general, right, this is the question we're really struggling with. Right? And so all right, now I'll, I'll, I'll shift to something more specific to our context. And again, not a medical doctor, don't know that much about anything, let alone launches in specific areas. But I think if we look at PCSK9 inhibitors, and we think about the excitement, the legitimate excitement. First of all, these were a, this was an amazing generation of drugs, right, that was put out by amazing companies built on amazing science, built by amazing scientists, and has not had the impact that was expected for it. Not because it turned out that the drug wasn't great, right? Just the rest of the system didn't come, in, come together. And you know, it's easy to blame the insurers. But again, in these stories, there are no, there are no bad guys. There are just people operating within the constraints that they face, right? And, and, and the, the, the reason this matters, by the way, is because what we need to realize is the space that we're occupying in the real world is much more complicated than just these four boxes. But once we realize that, we can have two different reactions. One is being overwhelmed. Oh my God, it's too complicated. <laughs> the other is that, well, if we understand these are all the different players, these are also players that we can deploy in different ways. Right? And I would say, when I look at 
PCS game. And this is, by the way, huge, huge appreciation and respect for everyone who's been involved in that journey. But at the same time, you know, I'm, you know I, 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 this morning I went and I, I, I got to listen to the patient advocates talking in the session. Clearly something has gone wrong. Okay, I'm not, I don't want to use the word, word failure, that's too absolute, but certainly there's not, there's not been enough impact. The impact has not been commensurate with the opportunity and the desire, right? And so there's, there's a failure to line things up here. And the reason this matters is, you know, so that, you know, the, the, the first squiggle, you may be, you know, you may recognize that's the PCSK9 protein, right? Now we have this whole new generation of drugs right on the cusp of launch for LP little a. And, you know, in our conversations preparing for today is like the one thing we don't want is to have to relive this same story, right? And so, so how do we solve these kinds of ecosystem challenges? It's rarely by reinforcing a single box. Okay, ecosystem problems require ecosystem solutions. What it means is realizing, all right, we need to align all these different actors. They, they somehow need to be aligned. And the question is, so who? Who is going to do it? Who's going to take care of what part and activate others to work in this way? So when I started, I told you, like, you know, I was, at first I was delighted to be here, and then kind of I'm actually, I'm genuinely excited so when I think about, so kind of new value propositions require new approaches to ecosystem alignment, right? That's like ecosystem problem means ecosystem solution. When I think about what the Family Heart Foundation has been able to achieve, right? And this was built into the original vision. It's interesting that, you know, this is a simplification, but we've had foundations, we have patient advocate, advocacy groups, you know, we have research organizations. I think by putting the three of these activities within this new boundary of an organization, you have been able to unlock effort and alignment in the rest of this ecosystem that could not have been achieved by a partnership between a patient advocacy group and a research group and a foundation on its own, right? That, you know, when I, I look at the Family Heart Foundation, it's, it is itself an ecosystem innovation. And from that position is able to mobilize other actors, right? So the, 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 the challenge, by the way, I think is, you know, there's a limit to what any one actor can do here. And so the question is, how do you inspire other actors in other parts of this ecosystem to innovate in this same way, of taking a little responsibility for things that aren't in their traditional box, right? How do we redraw the boundaries in order to get effort? Because what's interesting is, again, not only there are no bad guys here, and there's no one, there's no one who's saying, I'm rooting for LP little a. No one. Right? Everyone we're frustrated with, it's extra frustrating because like, yeah, we're, we're on the same side. We just can't get it together. And I, I think that the, the argument is that we can't get it together in the existing structure. Right? And so again, I look at Family Heart Foundation. It's an innovation in structure. And I think we need to see some more of this taking place in this environment. And I think with that, we'll see, we're likely to see a lot more progress a lot faster. Right, and I, and I think in that regard, I, kind of, I think in Keith's presentation, kind of you, you, you had that great slide, which is, you know, time does not equal progress. Doing the same thing over and over again over time, it equals effort, it equals goodwill and intent, but it doesn't actually change the game, right? That's what we're trying to do, right? And so this is, when, it, when, when we're thinking about innovation, we want to think more broadly, right, kind of the wide lens, we want to think about how to shift things. And so my hope is that, it, you take a little bit of this, and as we listen to the rest of the conference, where people who actually know things about disease and disease management, et cetera, as we're listening to the incredible things that they'll present, that somewhere between the front and the back of your mind will be this extra question of, well, so what else needs to happen? And you know, who else, who else can, can help or who else can participate? Right? And again, so this is, this is a slide that I had before this morning Right? And I think you know, this morning what I would extra underline is the ability to really activate other folks. Right? Patient advocates 
you have not just patient advocates, right? You have disease advocates, right? We have people trying to change the guidelines from here. And so kind of knocking over more dominoes, but partly it's knocking over dominoes and partly it's getting other actors to like rebuild a part of their space. By the way, in a way that makes sense for them, right? No one has to lose here. No one has to lose money here, right? We know in the end economics will matter, but there's so much value to be had, right? It's interesting, you know, you're saving human lives that people are responsible for, right? There's a cost to mismanaging this disease. We know that. So how do we reconfigure to activate that in an actionable way? That's, that's really kind of what I would put out there for you. So, you know, kind of reflecting on this, kind of what were my kind of the, 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 the key issues here are, you know, clearly it's, you know, there's an awareness part which has to do not just with a solution. Oh, do you know there's a new generation of drugs coming out, right? Equally, if I'm bigger, is awareness of the problem, right? And the awareness of the problem is both with patients and with clinicians, right? And the entire world of physician training, right? There's issues about guidelines for both treatment, but I think, you know, one of, some, some of what we heard earlier this morning is at least as much as about testing, right? We've got treatment. We're gonna get better treatment. But if you don't test, you don't know, you don't have the ability to do it. And again, kind of, I think, I, I, you know, I, all right, I have four minutes, I'm gonna finish a little early, but I will tell you that for me, one of the most meaningful discussions in the, the advocacy discussion earlier was the challenge that people face having been diagnosed in telling their families that members of their families should take action on the basis of this same potential diagnosis. Right, that's, that's a huge burden of responsibility to place on you know, someone who you know, just had a huge burden placed on them, right? And then kind of this, this notion of the guilt that you feel because now you have a, se a bad secret to tell about people you love without a real solution, right? And so this is doing more of just that information to that actor doesn't solve the problem, right? This is why I think really that's the, ar the argument for universal testing is because then it, we make that into a non-issue. Um, Right, I think we have to take the economics of this very seriously, realizing that it's, it's not just the risk and the reward for the different actors, but it's also the timelines. Right, so as I learned, part of the PCSK9 inhibitor problem with insurers was that it came right after, right, Mary taught me this, it came right after the development of a miracle cure for hepatitis, truly a miracle. And when you look at the value of a hepatitis vaccine on someone with hepatitis, it's millions of dollars. And the drug company said, you know what? You can have millions of dollars of value. All I need is $70,000. Big, big bargain. And from an insurance company perspective, it was a crisis because it was a bargain, but it needed to be paid all up front, right? And so this notion of timelines needs to be visited. This is not for patient advocacy groups. This is other players in the system, whether it's the pharma companies, the insurers, the government, the policymakers, what have you, right? But we need some innovation on that front, right? Clearly, you know, coalitions both within and across these communities, I think that is clearly happening here. And then also having different actors figure out what's their role. Like, where is it that you're leading? Where is it that you're enabling other people to be able to lead? Where is it that you follow? Meaning like you help pick a leader and you support them moving forward, right? And where is it that you're just supporting, right? And there's so many different places in this ecosystem that need effort that no one can lead everywhere, right? And so thinking through what are these roles, whether you know, you're on this side, you're on the corporate side, um, I think is critical. And then I think the other thing that is really exciting in this particular moment is supporting tools and, and technologies that are arriving at a really fast speed. Okay, so you know, so many people talked about how they discovered their diagnosis and then went to Google and discovered Family Health Foundation, and that's great, right? But you know, if you're reading the stuff about generative AI, the ability to get these diagnoses with more complete information that importantly still need to lead you back to the Family Heart Foundation. And you need to figure out how to do that. But I think there's, there's an awful lot that is changing that if we harness ourselves to it correctly, we can make a lot of progress. And by the way, you can do it incorrectly and realize five years later that you've made no progress. So with that, to this question of what else, we start with the question of what else do we need and then we ask, who else? Who else does that mean we need? 
And once we understand that, the question is, well, from their perspective, what needs to happen, right? So how can we get them aligned? So I hope that this is helpful to you. You are doing important things individually as advocates. Again, I think one of the most exciting things here is the multiple hats that everybody is wearing, right? We have patients, but patients are also advocates. We have doctors, doctors are also patients and advocates. We have, it's, 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 a, it's a really, it's, 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 it's a perfect way of solving a complex problem. I think that there's probably an awful lot for other parts of the healthcare system to learn from what you're doing here. Um, and I hope that this helps you become an even greater exemplar of how to do this right. Thank you very much. And I hope this helps.